So, um, a, a few house rules just before we begin. So, if, if everyone could keep their microphones to be muted, apart from the speaker. We expect courteous language from all the professionals who are on the call. And if you have questions, please put these in the chat or identify yourself to one of the organizers and we'll ask the question. We're very much looking to have this as a, an interactive session, but we should also be um, show respect to the speakers. What's going to happen in this session is that we have a number of short talks, and then we're going to get into a, a debate for about an hour in the second half of the session. Um, it's my job to try to keep everything to schedule, and I'll do my best to start with that. So I'd like to begin the session by introducing Senator the Honourable Leslie Campbell, and over to you, sir, in Jamaica. <laughs> Uh, thank you, footballer. Um, you know, the 1st of April um, had me going. Um, <laughs> thank you, Russell, um, from the Scottish Business Network. Uh, Mr. Killian Clifford, International Organization for Migration. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, and good night to you all, wherever you are in the world. Thank you for that kind introduction, Mr. Daglish. And thank you also for that overview on diaspora economic capital, the subject of our technical working group. Allow me to thank the organizers for the excellent arrangements which have facilitated our participation. And in this regard, I look forward to a successful outcome to these deliberations. It's a pleasure to join you as host of this technical working group on diaspora economic, economic capital. As stated by Mr. Daglish, the aims of this technical working group are to identify best practices, but also to quote, to identify where we as policymakers, practitioners, organizations, and as a sector need to go next and how we can work together to get these out there, unquote. I'm grateful for this opportunity to learn about your respective countries and the mechanisms and strategies adopted to strengthen and deepen engagement with your respective diaspora communities within the context of di diaspora economic capital. I'm happy to share our own experiences with you. Jamaica's engagement with its community overseas includes all the specific themes related to economic capital, namely business and entrepreneurship activities, trade activities, remittance sending and utilization behaviors, that is philanthropy, savings and investment behavior, and least but among them, but not last, or last among them, but not least, is tourism. I will focus on philanthropy and remittance sending, as these are areas where we have most experience and where perhaps there's room for global collaborative action. We're very keen to learn about existing partnerships in this regard and key actors who can partner with governments to increase the impact of engagement of diaspora economic capital and indeed how the future agenda document can support such partnerships. Members of our diaspora, various organizations and friends of Jamaica provide invaluable support in cash and kind to Jamaica. They have an abiding affinity to Jamaica and make significant donations to their communities. Over the years, many Jamaicans have benefited individually or as a community from the philanthropic endeavors of the diaspora, especially in the fields of education and health. This unparalleled generosity and support was recently demonstrated in the context of Jamaica's response to the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020-21. Their contributions directly assisted the government's response to COVID-19 pandemic, 
and were of critical importance in supporting the most vulnerable in our communities and our, and our frontline workers. Donations of personal protective equipment and online learning devices in keeping with the priority areas <clears throat> identified by the government in its response to the pandemic amounted to over Jamaican $500 million. Philanthropic activities included, but were not limited to medical missions to Jamaica and community development initiatives. In our efforts to attract diaspora economic capital, our network of high commissions, embassies, consulates, general overseas, <clears throat> and consulates general overseas, prioritize the facilitation of trade and investment initiatives as well as maintain and strengthen relations with the diaspora through our economic diplomacy program. The program, which is being implemented by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade in partnership with JAMPRO, that is Jamaica <clears throat> Investment Promotion Agency, is geared towards the economic development of Jamaica and support for Jamaicans in the diaspora. As Minister with Responsibility for Diaspora Affairs, I've been actively engaged in strengthening these, these relations with diaspora, including the promoting of business and investment opportunities, and advising of improvements in systems and measures to encourage investment and to facilitate the ease of doing business in Jamaica. As reflected in the working group background paper, the government of Jamaica announced a Rediscover Jamaica campaign which encourages domestic tourism through diaspora marketing. These and other measures have been introduced to incentivize nationals who are desirous, desirous of returning home to work, study, or invest in Jamaica. Other government initiatives include reform of the stamp duty and reduction of transfer tax payable on transfer of property. We anticipate that these measures will further encourage our community overseas to invest in Jamaica towards the development of the country. It is also anticipated that these measures will benefit and empower nationals wherever they reside. According to the World Bank, remittances registered strong growth in most regions. Flows increased by 21.6% in Latin America and the Caribbean. 9.7% in the Middle East and North America, 8% in South Asia, 6.2% in Sub-Saharan Africa, and 5.3% in Europe and Central Asia. In Latin America and the Caribbean, growth was exceptionally strong due to the economic recovery in the United States and additional factors, including migrants' responses to natural disasters in their countries of origin, and remittances sent from home countries to migrants in transit. These resources represent important private flows to individuals, which have buttressed in income levels and consumption. The fact that remittances increased during the period of the pandemic is a strong testament of the commitment of our diaspora community to offer support to their families during times of crisis. For 2021, Bank of Jamaica figures indicate that remittance inflows exceeded US 3.3 billion, representing an increase of over the 2020 figure, which stood at 2.9 billion. The World Bank has indicated that remiss remittance flows have greatly complemented government cash transfer programs to support families suffering economic hardships during COVID-19 crisis. And that facilitating the flow of remittances to provide relief of strained household budgets should be a key component of government policies to support a global recovery from the pandemic. We endorse this position and support efforts to partner with private entities to facilitate research, dialogue, development, and implementation for the safe and efficient transmission of remittances. 
We will also support efforts that promote financial literacy for migrants and the recipients of these transfers to enhance volume, management, and develop an impact of these remittances. While it is difficult to quantify diaspora economic capital overall, the government recognizes its huge impact on the economy. They are recognized as investors, partners, marketers, networkers, and key collaborators with the government of Jamaica, businesses, and civil society. It is our practice to invite and encourage full participation of the diaspora in activities that enhance the national development process, as well as empower the diaspora community in the countries where they reside. Ladies and gentlemen, it is our hope that by participating in this dialogue, we will both inform and be informed of best practices moving forward. I look forward to the upcoming exchange and thank you for listening. Thank you, Leslie. That was a wonderful speech. And I, I can greatly identify with that movement of capital, which occurred during the pandemic. And I think diasporas became more evident to the world than ever during the last two years. So thank you for your words. I would now like to call to speak Killian Clifford of the IOM. Killian is a senior migration governance expert with responsibility for migrant financial and economic empowerment. Welcome. Thank you, Russell. I'm just hoping everyone can see my screen there. I think you can. Um, thank you for that introduction, Russell. And thank, thank you to the Honorable Leslie Campbell for presenting on the uh, diaspora investment uh, within Jamaica. Very interesting to hear that. Um, so I'm going to present to you today an overview of a technical background paper for this particular session that we uh, prepared in advance of it. And it was posted on the iDiaspora website, IOM website, um, for, for this particular session. But if you didn't have the chance to read it, don't worry. I'll cover off the uh, pertinent points here. And the idea is to set the scene and present where current thinking is on diaspora economic capital and outline a potential framework for engagement uh, for uh, after the summit um, and present some of the guiding questions for discussion that might feed also into the outcome document for this summit. And that document is known as the future agenda document. And that future agenda document will be the mandate of how we engage uh, going forward. Okay, so let me begin on the overview of the, this particular paper. So on the on diaspora economic capital, that, so the role that migrants can play in the sustainable development of their countries of origin and destination is increasingly being recognized within global migration governance and specifically within the global compact of migration, which you're all uh, very familiar with, no, no doubt. Um, and that shapes much of the dialogue within a within specific area. So within the Global Compact, Objective 19 calls for signatories to create the conditions for migrants and diasporas to fully contribute to sustainable development in all countries. And in the context of today's meeting, all countries includes both countries of destination uh, and countries of origin. And as part of sustainable development, there is an increasing recognition of the role that migrant economic capital can play in achieving this goal. So embedded or deep within uh, Objective 19, Article 35E calls for signatories. Now, this is a bit of a mouthful, but I'll read it out anyway. Develop targeted support programs and financial products that facilitate migrant and diaspora investments and entrepreneurship, including by providing administrative and legal support and business creation and granting seed capital matching, establish diaspora bonds, diaspora development funds and investment funds and organized dedicated trade fairs. So those are examples of uh, diaspora economic capital, but that list isn't of itself exhaustive. Uh, so how can we define or how should we define economic capital? Well, more broadly, economic capital can be described as any economic resource used to buy and or make products 
and provide services. So using that definition, we can see that economic capital can be both financial and crucially non-financial. And to fully realize the potential of the diaspora and migrant economic capital, we as stakeholders need to understand where and how it can be engaged and whether this can realistically be done without first properly engaging and building relationships with diaspora communities. Now, we touched upon this earlier on in the philanthropy session, uh, and no doubt we'll, we'll, uh, in, the, in the discussions afterwards, we'll, we'll touch on it again. Um, so often remittances are the entry point and springboard to unlocking other types of financial economic capital, whether it's investment, entrepreneurship, trade, etc. But the diaspora philanthropy may itself be the entry point for engaging with diaspora groups before engaging with financial, their financial economic capital. Of course, there are many international initi initiatives promoting remittances, uh, but less on unlocking other forms of economic capital. So the overriding question in the paper, uh, in the, for, it, for the technical group as well, is how can we work together to build sustainable systems of engagement with the diaspora communities that will allow us to leverage diaspora economic capital for it to continue to, uh, to contribute to uh, sustainable development? So let's take a look at the different types of economic capital that can apply for both countries uh, of origin and destination. Focusing uh, firstly on countries of origin, uh, well, remittances are the, the topic that everyone knows a lot about. So the historical discussion on diaspora economic capital has traditionally been grounded in remittances. However, in recent years, it has broadened to encompass other forms of diaspora economic capital. But before we discuss those, it's worth reminding ourselves of the role that remittances play. So at a macro level, you're probably familiar with this chart from the World Bank uh, that Dilip Ratha and his team put together, which shows us that excluding China, remittance flows into developing countries are greater than uh, foreign direct investment, FDI, and overseas development assistance, ODA, uh, combined. And they are the maroon colors and the red FDI line on that. So remittances is greater than those two uh, sums combined. So there is significant international flow into developing countries uh, and an international flow that remained resilient through the pandemic. And at a micro level, so at the level of the migrant or the diaspora, if you prefer, the remittances, if remittances are channeled properly through linked financial services, they can also be the launch pad for other diaspora capital mobilizations. Um, but again, Work bearing in mind, critical discourse points out that 70% of remittances may sometimes be spent on consumption, uh, which can lead to remittance dependency and not necessarily leave a lot over for diaspora investment. So it's why this is why it's worth understanding the motivation of why migrants send remittances in the first place and how they are used. And of course, data collection is very important in understanding that. Migrant digital and financial literacy and migrant digital and financial inclusion is also important if the diaspora are to realize the power of their economic capital. And in the paper, we provide examples of from relevant GIZ projects in this area that offer training to migrants to use their remittances for longer term investments. And those investments can come in many forms. So they could be diaspora bank accounts, for instance, either local or foreign currencies, and those particular bank accounts and may have attractive interest rates to entice investments. Those investments could also be in debt, such as diaspora bonds, which you're hearing more of, and the funds from those bonds may or may not be earmarked for specific purposes. Uh, often these bonds can attract what's called a diaspora premium, meaning they can be uh, a cheap form of financing or funding for governments. Um, the diaspora may also choose equity investments, and that is directly investing in local businesses in their countries of origin, or maybe indirectly uh, through the stock market or funds. And in the paper, we include uh, the example of the Roshan Digital Account Initiative in Pakistan that managed to combine all these three types uh, of diaspora investment through various incentives. So, other types of diaspora capital, um, which we heard about in the case of Jamaica, can include entrepreneurship and trade. So diaspora may choose to open businesses of their own in their countries of origin. And diaspora nest networks are well positioned to break down the barriers and connect businesses in both countries of residence and origin to establish bilateral trading relationships. And this way, they can also be providers of social remittances in terms of skill development uh, and mentoring businesses 
uh, that they invest in. So this is a type of diaspora philanthropy that we spoke of earlier in terms of uh, time and talent, lending that time, lending that talent uh, to, to communities uh, back in countries of origin. And in turn, these in initiatives could potentially be aimed at women or youth or at rural poor. We heard that in the World Bank session uh, at the break. Um, or even they could be directly uh, aimed at their local communities, contributing to inclusive, sustainable development. So there are a number of examples of this in the paper, again, of this happening, uh, including in the case of Ireland, but in the case of Intel choosing to invest in Ireland, and also the role that the Ireland funds uh, played in the peace process uh, within Northern Ireland. Um, and of course, as we heard specifically within the case of Jamaica just now, diaspora tourism uh, can be an important source of, of tourist dollars and a diaspora investment for a, a country of origin. But what are countries of residence? How do they stand to benefit from engaging with diaspora economic capital? Well, countries of origin are often prioritized in this discussion, but countries of residence can benefit too. So diaspora investing in their countries of origin can work in the interests of the country of residence. So by leveraging networks of influence in diaspora groups, countries of residence can build important bilateral ties with countries of origin. So marketing through the buying power of diaspora groups can help businesses in countries of residence. And diaspora change makers or leaders can act as mentors to nurture and leverage diaspora capital in countries of residence. And by engaging in diaspora communities in this, this way, it can lead to circular development and job creation across both countries of origin and countries of res residence, uh, which you might consider a form of economic diplomacy. And we, we, we touched again on this in the earlier session on uh, diaspora, uh, diaspora philanthropy. Uh, called, it, it was termed give where you live. So diaspora philanthropy is not just aimed at countries of or origin, but also countries of residence too. But how can we engage diaspora and economic capital? So if we've just talked about the different types of economic capital, the paper also provides a baseline for a framework of engagement with diaspora and leveraging diaspora uh, economic capital. And we'd love to hear from you, uh, from the audience uh, in the interactive discussion, uh, what you think about this particular framework uh, or specific examples you could show. So um, we've, we've included here an example at an institutional, informational and implementation level. And this can be done, for instance, as an example, by assigning ownership for diaspora engagement at a high level within government. We certainly have that in the case of Jamaica. And then coordinating activities by employing a whole of government approach. Then developing appropriate data frameworks for measuring and monitoring diaspora economic contributions. And through the analysis of that data, developing the appropriate strategies to engage with diaspora and better leverage their economic capital, whether that is via entry points such as diaspora philanthropy, as you saw, or even including stakeholders and partners, such as the private sector, civil society, diaspora groups, et cetera. There's many ways uh, to do this. And there's many ways, there's examples of this in, in the actual paper itself. But if you want to delve a little deeper into a, a framework, IOM's own contribution and countering report has concrete examples and suggestions of how this can be operationalized in, in, in your country and specifically for measuring contributions of diaspora economic capital beyond remittances. So we've seen the different types of economic capital and how we might conceptualize a diaspora engagement framework, but what does that mean for the future of diaspora economic capital? How can we continue collaboration to set the agenda on this thematic going forward? Well, the opportunity exists for the outcomes from this particular working group and this session today to feed into the outcome document for the Global Diaspora Summit. And as I said, that's called the Future Agenda Document, and whose aim will be to shape the global collaboration on, on, on diaspora engagement uh, going forward. So this will also feed into the monitoring for the global compact on migration, including Objective 19, and that is happening uh, via the uh, International Migration Review Forum, the IMRF, in New York next month. Um, so to insist in that dialogue and in the discussion today, we have presented three guiding questions for your consideration in the discussion, and they're on the themes of policy, programs, and partnership, and we'll discuss them in a while. But just to familiar yourself with them, the, here they are on the screen. Within the terms of policy, 
what can the future agenda document recommend at a policy level to achieve global collaboration on diaspora economic capital? On the program level, what are the programs that are there for diaspora engagement to leverage economic capital? And on the partnership side, who are the key actors, stakeholders to partner with governments to increase the impact of diaspora economic capital? So that's the summation of the paper. Um, that will form the discussion as well uh, uh, in a moment's time. Um, but at that point, I will just hand back to Russell and thank you all for your time today. Thank you very much for that and perfect timing as well. We always have a very professional session here, so that's a great start. Um, we'll come back to that examination of the questions in the discussion later in our, our gathering. But next, we're going to take an, an international view and we're going to hear from three speakers looking at Tanja Dedovic, who's going to look at thoughts from Africa, Ulan Nogoyabev, who's going to share us a view from Kyrgyzstan, and Laura Rola, who's going to give us a view from Latin America. And I'd like to apologise for I pronounced all of your names. But could we start with Tanya? Thank you very much, uh, um, Mr. Chair, and uh, a good afternoon to our distinguished audience. Um, it is my pleasure to present to you uh, the main outcomes from the Africa consultations. So I would like to take this discussion to a continental level at this point, because what I'm presenting to you are, in a way, the findings from the discussions that we had just a couple of days ago, um, in the Africa consultations on the four capitals. And um, so on the first uh, question on policies, we have actually heard from a number of countries who participated in this consultation um, that they are all thinking about setting up investment funds. And we have also heard from the representative of the African Union Commission that there is uh, the intent to set up an African diaspora uh, financing corporation, which will be sort of a continental investment fund, which should also allow transnational diaspora engagement. So not um, a Nigerian investing in Nigeria, just as an example, but a Nigerian being able to decide where to invest with his uh, savings or with his uh, funds anywhere in Africa. Um, we have also heard talking about policy um, that one prerequisite uh, for engaging with, uh, with um, diaspora also in the economic uh, sense is to have a, actually a diaspora policy. So that does not exist yet um, in every country, but it definitely helps to bring together the whole of government, to bring all the line ministries together. Um, also when it comes to engaging with diaspora and with the economic capital of diaspora. Um, and we have also talked and, and what came up uh, as, a, as a challenge uh, when we were talking about uh, setting up uh, such uh, policies and such uh, instruments like an investment fund. Since we are talking about money and we are talking about investment, the trust issue. So we think that that is yet another policy that the government needs uh, to put in place um, to have really a strong ongoing regular communication with diaspora, uh, also in terms of reporting back to diaspora on how funds are being utilized and um, yeah, to establish the trust. Um, we heard one good practice um, in the sense that uh, Cote d'Ivoire was uh, telling us that they have an annual diaspora forum where they decide on a list of recommendations that then needs to be followed up. And that list of recommendations sort of turns into a work plan, a work program for the participants um, to implement until they meet again the next year and where they then review how many of the recommendations from the past year have actually been implemented. 
in terms of programs, um, we heard that uh, especially also when it comes to engaging with diaspora and their economic capital, what is needed is to have uh, more knowledge about uh, the diaspora and their interests in terms of investment, their concerns, their expectations. So in essentially the need for programming in terms of conducting diaspora mapping. Um, and I think we, we, we can make available tools um, to allow for mapping um, basically on all four capitals uh, with the diaspora mapping methodology that has been developed uh, by IOM and which I believe has also been presented and launched during this Global Diaspora Summit. There is also another more specific tool that we have developed in partnership um, um, with DMA Global, which allows governments to actually try to disaggregate data on financial contributions from diaspora that go beyond remittances. So we are, you know, involving here also the whole of government approach, not just the, the ministries of diaspora, but the ministries of trade, the ministries of finance, the ministries of tourism. I have already heard that there was a lot of talk about diaspora tourism, but do we have the data to be able to attribute the contribution from diaspora in all these areas? So that's um, the need for data programming in terms of data collection, diaspora mapping. In addition, um, we have heard uh, from uh, a number of go governments in these consultations that they had, again, talking about programming, uh, set up startup funds that allow uh, diaspora to uh, set up uh, startup businesses. Um, and yeah, that's also the same. And, uh, and another country was telling us about the plan to put in place a number of financial products for diaspora. Um, in the short term, they were thinking about setting up um, with commercial banks a credit line, um, which would allow diaspora to to be accessed uh, for starting up uh, businesses. In the longer term, they were thinking about uh, setting up um, a bank um, for, for diaspora, offering specific financial products for diaspora. Now, who are the key actors um, in government? in governments in countries of origin and governments uh, in countries of residence? So here, once again, uh, the emphasis was made that key actors means the whole of government. Um, and we heard that diaspora is a key actor. A government was uh, making the proposal that diaspora should actually be part of any bilateral dialogue that is happening between a country of origin and country of destination. And finally, the chambers of commerce were mentioned as a key actor, especially when it comes to engage with economic capital, because chambers of commerce can connect diaspora businesses with businesses um, back home, with investors back home, the banks back at home, and also uh, chambers of commerce probably in cooperation with diaspora, can help with uh, export of uh, so-called nostalgia goods to promote nostalgia trade. Uh -huh. I think that is uh, in short. Can I, can, I, can I thank you? That That's the, the, the time slot has come to an end, but you, I, I completely identified with some of your words. And at the present moment, as we sit here today, uh, Scottish Business Network, the diaspora organisation, is working in partnership with the Scottish Chambers to deliver a trade mission in Miami as we speak. So the perfect example. Thank you so much for your time. Um, could I now turn to Ulan? Uh, thank you, colleagues. I would like to know that we represent different continents and different countries, but nevertheless, 
We have the same objective, and I'm again persuaded that labor migrants are similar in different countries. They're like brothers or sisters, like twins. Today we've heard a lot of initiatives, about lots of initiatives and examples of successes and different sessions singled out instances in Kyrgyzstan and in other countries as well, which are very similar to other countries. So I'm not going to reiterate or repeat what has already been said. I'm just going to talk through the main key points. The first one on the first issue, when we talk about the economic capital, yes, I would agree with the presenter from the International Organization for Migration that there are different economic capitals. When we talk about econ economic capital, it's not just remittances, it's also skills, professional development, which our labor migrants input into our countries together with the economic capital. In our group, we also discuss the issue of the economic capital from the point of view of attracting finance, skills and education. A lot of participants, including myself, representing Kyrgyzstan, pointed out that at present economic capital plays an important role, not just in the destination countries, but also the countries of origin, where in economic capital or remittances are being sent. For instance, one third of the GDP of Kyrgyzstan is consisted, consists, consists of remittances, but does do they use it correctly, this economic capital? Unfortunately, no. And we had exactly the same picture emerging in other countries and on other continents. What do we need? It is important to use educational programs, awareness raising. These educational programs must and should be used as part of the network systems, we need to share best practices between our countries. It was also the proposal from our group. And of course, everybody welcomed that. They started talking about the Philippines and our Philippine representative, in fact, pointed out that similar programs do exist in the Philippines and they share the experience with other countries. Apart from the economic capital, that we have talked about. We talked about attracting or involving diasporas and economic capital. Diasporas play a very important role in the development of the economy of both countries, origin and destination. Origin and destination. We also shared experience and talked about the fact that today diasporas become first and foremost as philanthropists, philanthropists, beneficiaries, or benefactors rather. Secondly, migrants as investors. And third, thirdly, when we talk about global processes, in our group, we indicated the possibility of using international programs which are already in operation. Our Moldova colleagues talked about one plus one program. The EU has launched this program very successfully in a number of countries. And today it is also operating in Moldova very successfully. And there are other countries who actively make use of that program. In, and our country, Kyrgyzstan, also has a vested interest in implementing such a program in our country. We're studying it in detail now. There's no point in inventing the wheel, reinventing the wheel. There are lots of examples of successes which could be shared with the rest. Further, when we talk about partnerships, key participants, key members of the partnerships with governments are first and foremost the diaspora organizations. But I would also like to point out that there were other suggestions to use not just the diaspora organizations as partners, but also non-governmental organizations, civil society organizations. These are the same federations of migration, 
of migrants, business associations, educational associations. At present, educational associations play a very important role in increasing migrants' potential, in raising that potential. Migrants are very flexible participant of the process. They're always ready to learn, to improve their skills and their knowledge. Improvement of skills and knowledge should be a priority. That's first and foremost. Secondly, we also talked about education for children of migrants, families of migrants, and their wives, particularly women, wives, while their brothers, fathers, sisters working abroad, laboring abroad, the families of migrants, unfortunately, and this picture repeats itself in different countries of Asia, Africa, and Eastern Europe. Those families of migrants do not receive the necessary level of attention. So it's important to focus both for the governments, but also for civil society organizations on those families. So when we talked about education, we talked about the economic capital. We talked about the fact that our labor migrants, as somebody pointed out correctly, Mr. Campbell pointed out earlier on, 70% of all the monetary resources are being spent into a black hole, are being wasted. So our participants pointed out that financial awareness, the correct use of remittances is extremely important. In particular, they noted that there are already functioning small programs on teaching families of migrants, not just migrants themselves, but also educating their families. Time has come to stop the negative procedures of wasting money, wasting money or spending it to, 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 to buy luxury housing or luxury cars. It's better to use this money for education, for proper education for migrant children so that they would not turn into labor migrants themselves but become educated experts, professionals, particularly as money is already available from their parents for that purpose. Furthermore, sorry, the picture has frozen. Thank you, Ulan. It was um, I, I, it was great to have the translation there so that I could follow your your words. Thank you very much for that. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. I try to be sure. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Um, I'd now like to turn to uh, Laura, who is in Latin America. Thank you, Ulan. Thank you so much, Ulan. Thank you so much to Tanya as well, to Killian for having introduced us. I'm going to try also to be very, very brief so that we can try and catch up with time and also to help you. And so in order to help, there was a presentation that I was going to actually screen share on. I don't know if that's actually been done at the moment. Are you actually able to see a shared screen at the moment? Great, absolutely brilliant. Right, so my name's Laura Roya. I am the coordinator of the regional diaspora program that's being developed with the IOM from its Buenos Aires office. In this project, we're obviously working on these topics and we've held a workshop within the framework of the um, South American Conference for Migration. And then there was the regional conference that was part of that on migration. And so it's within that context that we actually presented this working dynamic from which we are basically able to get those inputs um, about the economic capital on the part of the diaspora, which is what I'm going to 
be presenting to you in this current presentation. So on my first slide here, what we can all see here is specifically the first component of this that we've obviously spoken about with the countries participating, and it's to do with political considerations when it comes to achieving agreements or answers. And I think that the first point here um, was to do with this need to prioritise data generation. You know, there are a lot of organisations that were all reading from the same hymn book when it came to talking about data collection when it comes to um, this remittance is really not um, categorised in any easy to use way according to the country. And so we had to sort of get away from dwelling on this um, in a very detailed way, but it's obviously key to be able to create this shared data and the, the added value therein. And so the second political aspect of all of this that we actually dwelled on actually identified the need as one of the challenges for this was to work in um, an adequate to work on an adequate dissemination of um, information, which is the only thing that's going to be able to facilitate exchanges between governments of origin countries and destination countries. And so we have to systemize the, that data and the exchange of this data as well is also central and key to everything that we are spoke, speaking about in our work. And I think that we also then need to move on to the programmatic considerations so as to press on and move forward. And I think that some of the countries already made concrete references to some of the programmes. I think that one of our colleagues already mentioned that when it comes to actually buying a property, there is this need to articulate the resources available um, to the diaspora so that we can channel uh, government programmes into these areas. And I think that we can also propose monitoring mechanisms so that we're able to actually uh, control and have some factual counts and evidence on contributions to the country of origin. And this is also overlapping with topics that the previous speakers, my colleagues, have spoken about as well. And so I think that in terms of associations, I just wanted to say that when it comes to linking up with other actors was so to be able to achieve some of these objectives. What we actually prioritised in our group was conversations on the role of academia, understanding this to be on models of decision making and analysis of um, information that would be systematised, you know, this particular actor or that one might have a lot to bring to the table. And then civil society, right, we have to talk about the role of represent representatives from diaspora associations. And then just briefly, the three points that we'd like to prioritise when it comes to economic capital and when we're talking about economic capital, is basically collaboration so as to be able to build those information systems that I've mentioned and also a support network in the origin countries that also has to go hand to hand with institutional with institutional initiatives. And then obviously we need to generate joint strategies so that the information available on opportunities is shared with all of the different diaspora communities. And this should obviously also include vulnerable groups, women, and absolutely everyone that's in a vulnerable situation, obviously take into account diversity. Thank you so much for giving me the floor and having finished this round, I'm going to pass, you, pass the mic straight back to you, Russell. Um, building information systems, because that's been our experience is using publicly available data and particular platforms to identify diaspora members globally has just been incredible and so cheap. <laughs> um, thank you very much to our speakers. We're now going to enter the next stage, which is to, uh, to bring everyone together to discuss our three questions. Um, so the questions are on policy, around economic capital, programmatic capital, and partnerships and where we see partnerships fitting in. 
So I think the way that we've been asked to do this session is that we will take the first question and then accept comments from everyone in the room. So if we could just take away the, um, the, the large language interpretation screen, just so that we can see everyone. So the first question, and uh, Colleen, correct me if I got this wrong, it's what can the future agenda document recommend at a policy level to achieve global collaborative action on diaspora economic capital? Perfect, got it right. Thank you for putting that there. So this is the policy question. So um, could I ask um, who would like to come in um, and unmute yourself to discuss your thoughts on policy? And if I could ask each contributor to keep their comments to no more than two minutes, that would be excellent. Thank you. Has anyone got any comments they would like to share on policy? Perhaps if I could ask, oh, sorry. Yes, please, Connie, and you come. Okay, bonjour, merci à tous. Connie Lanzini, sous-directeur à la Direction Générale des Ivoiriens de la Diaspora du ministère Thank you, I'm Connie uh, Cote from the uh, Côte d'Ivoire, uh, representing the Côte d'Ivoire diaspora. We are happy to um, concernant la politique give our recommendation regarding the policy. Um, we have adopted a policy in 2018 that takes into account uh, how we valorize the human capital and how we uh, mobilize uh, the savings of diaspora and how we reinvest it on this different economic sectors. So We've joined a collaboration between uh, the um, public treasury of uh, the uh, Côte d'Ivoire and uh, the saving, the management of the saving of the diaspora. And we've been able to develop our economy uh, regarding how to invest or to uh, involve the diaspora. We are working with several. Uh, investment uh, chambers, uh, trade chambers, and the uh, uh, Chambre des Métiers to uh, valorize different uh, sectors. What partnerships have we, um, have we launched since the beginning? So there are public partners, but also the uh, African Solidarity Fund. Uh, we've signed an agreement in 2019 to implement um, uh, a way of investing the diaspora saving. And if everything's fine, we'll start to see the results this year. I've noted the third question. I had a connection issue. So sorry, I cannot answer the third question. However, uh, I'll end up my... Uh, my contribution right now. I might raise my hand again afterwards. Thank you very much for your contribution. Okay. 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 Thank you now. Thank you, Connie Cotty. Um, we have some other people coming in now, so I'd now like to go to Nudama. Would you like to switch your video on and come in to talk? You have your hand raised at the moment. Nuduma? Ah, there we go. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> uh, this is Harriet Nduma. Maybe Harriet will be simpler for you. Yes, I'd just like to um, just share uh, what our experience is back in Kenya. And before I do that, let me just say how sorry we are. We had some challenges here in Dublin in terms of our connectivity. But that is all done now, so we are on board. This is a quick uh, contribution to this very exciting uh, debate. Kenya, um, 
as you know, we've been invited here as one of the leading uh, countries, and there is reason to that. And uh, following most of the listeners that have we've had today, the uh, establishment or the formulation of the Kenya diaspora policy way back immediately after the ministerial forum in Geneva on diaspora. 2014 uh, was the formulation of that uh, policy. And we've made a lot of gain out of that policy. And just because the Minister of Foreign Affairs is charged or is mandated to pursue the diaspora policy uh, with other stakeholders from uh, ministries, uh, from agencies, from media, from all other stakeholders, including the international bodies. And that is good because it has all that approach of government and non-stakeholders together. And therefore, bringing in what we estimate as 3 million uh, Kenyans living out in the diaspora, an estimation because Kenyans are not are compelled by any law to register with Kenyan missions abroad, and therefore that is an estimated figure that we, we work with, uh, depending on the figures we get from our missions. Our achievement in terms of the diaspora is, of course, the financial remittances that have taken up our traditional foreign exchange earners. Uh, during COVID, that's where we saw a lot of money coming to the country. Of course, families out in the diaspora wanted to help their own families back home. So yes, we like speaking about remittances because that is a big deal for us. And what we've seen the, the policy give us in terms of, uh, of remitting money is the mechanisms that uh, some of our partners, of course, government agencies like the Central Bank of Kenya, reducing the high cost of remitting money. Still high, but uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, work has gone into that. We've seen the use of ICT using our money M-Pesa to bring in uh, Kenyans to remit their money. We've seen our own banks actually develop their own desks, design uh, their own products uh, targeted to the diaspora. And therefore, for us in Kenya, the policy has done so much in terms of creating intermediary facilities that, that have provided uh, the investment uh, incentives uh, to the diaspora uh, to invest back home. We've seen a lot of public partnerships, especially in the real estate in Kenya. However, uh, what, despite uh, you know, all these uh, good practices and uh, experiences, our issue of, um, of not having a framework, an incentive framework to promote diaspora participation uh, in the national development agenda has been one of our, of our challenges. Uh, we really feel that uh, that is an area that probably in this document, when you are looking at international cooperation, we should look at how African or countries are going to be assisted in coming up with incentive frameworks that promote a diaspora participation in the sustainable development agenda. The other issue that we feel should also be brought on board is the issue of protection you know, protection of, uh, of human rights, uh, looking into the welfare of our diaspora out there. And when I say our diaspora is not only the Kenyan diaspora, but all our diaspora, especially in countries uh, that, that the issue of human rights is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is of concern. We feel corporations should also look into that over and above investment, that the issues of, uh, of our of our people's uh, welfare and rights. So yes, as a way of contribution, that is what I would share for today. Of course, the issue of data, we really need uh, to have uh, cooperation in data. Of course, whether it is supporting governments to have an integrated diaspora information system, I think that would go a long way in gathering the data. Mapping out, of course, of diaspora. I had a bit of that, then I went off the, the internet, so I could not follow the, the discourse. And of course, strengthening our institutions in various countries and documentation centers, really, so that uh, we have a seamless flow of information, a maintaining of data, and updating 
whatever is out there, because we have got some data in one form or the other. But again, we need uh, to, to engage further. We need to look into how we can really strengthen that part so that a, an integrated database of Kenyans living abroad will be there. And of course, the other issue is uh, coordination. Uh, for us, we feel the issue of coordination would be very useful because the stakeholders are many. I think in the case of Kenya, we have got over 30 uh, stakeholders and we are counting because again, the diaspora is changing, the landscape is changing. So we've, we know that this might not, the station might not obtain in the long run. And therefore the issue of coordination, we're in the process of having to establish our national diaspora council that will champion the diaspora affairs and of course become an advisory body to the government on issues diaspora. And that is one area that we feel the document could also uh, look at how it can help government. Naduma, can, can I thank you for those comments? I think particularly that the concept of framework and data to help to build policy is excellent. But I'm now going to ask our, our next um, uh, speaker to come on. Thank you. I'm going to ask uh, Kingsley Aitkins, can you join in now with your point? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Russell. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Um, I, you know, listening to these different people and all these fantastic contributions and learning about what's happening in different countries, I wonder if there's a there's a need for the future agenda document to um to have in place some way of, um, if you like, an audit of what's happening in all these different places around the world. You know, you know, when I started in this game many years ago, as you know, Russell, there was only a few countries involved. And then Scotland came along and everybody followed. But it wasn't really, you know, there wasn't a huge number of people. Now it's extraordinary, the number of countries. And now it's not just countries, it's regions. And in some cases, it's cities who are developing policies. But there's no, it seems to me, central uh, depository of knowledge. There's no one place that we could go and find out. Oh, I learn, I'm learning all the time. But if there was one place, and I wonder if the future agenda document could in some way um, uh, recommend that as a, as, a, as a potential kind of uh, um, idea. Um, the other point I was going to make is, uh, and you probably have a view of this from, from your own experience in Scotland, is who owns who owns the information? You know, you start building up the data, and the data is basically who are they, where are they, what are they doing? And you know, I work for an organization, we built up a database of over a hundred thousand people around the world. And of course, everybody wanted our database because they wanted to sell things to them, you know. So uh and, and we didn't want to share that. So in a way, there's there's two contradictory things. The first point I'm saying is this global sharing of what's going on in the space. Where do we could could the IOM or could the future agenda be a reflection of that? Answer that issue. And then the second point is like who owns this information? And if if everybody's quite possessive, and that's totally understandable of what they've built up in their own database, um, how do we get around that issue if we can? Does that make sense? Absolutely. Thank you for that contribution. And and on the point of data, um, I, I've always believed it's the individual that owns their own their own data. They then have the right to share that data with organisations where they wish to be engaged in a particular way. So, for example, if someone was to share their email with me because they wish to know more about the Scottish, more about Scotland, then it wouldn't be appropriate for them to perhaps me to perhaps phone them up and try and sell them a website. So, I think there's a there's a key there about how we as individuals want to be addressed in that. And what, what we found, just, just to share a little bit of our personal experience, is that we use um, public platforms where individuals agree to share their data across the platform in a controlled manner. And our most successful platform was LinkedIn. So on a budget of zero, we built um, a network of 10,000 people globally across 76 countries. And that was because we used a platform where individuals had agreed to share that data. I think Kingsley's other point about um, measurement, it comes into best practice as well, and how we can all share what's worked in our particular area with other diaspora groups, because we're unique in this area and that we're not competing. Uh, just to finish this piece, of, oh, sorry, um, Daniela, you would like to come in. Thank you, Kingsley. 
Thank you so much, Russell. Uh, this has been a super interesting discussion and obviously there's a lot of interesting data. I do want to propose an extension <laughs> to that. Uh, there's been so much action in the diaspora with different types of policies and programs, but um, kind of like little in terms of evaluating interventions across the board um, in different sectors, across different countries in a systematic way. So there's a lot of anecdotal evidence, a lot of descriptives, but when it comes to like measuring the magnitude of that impact and then drawing insights on uh, in a systematic way on what types of interventions can be generalized. I mean, there's been a lot of talk around exporting the Irish diaspora engagement model, but that's done kind of an, in an ad hoc way. So if there's a more systematic approach to evaluating uh, diaspora policies, then we can also move into deciding what elements are useful and effective when we think of scaling diaspora uh, models or coming up with frameworks that could be successful to guide countries who are looking to move into this space. Oh, that's excellent. Th thank you so much for that contribution. And, and I think, is it possible that what we're trying to do is to come up with a common language and a common set of terms whereby in different parts of the world, we can discuss how these things are working, how we are engaging and how successful we are being. Uh, if he's here, I was going to ask, uh, Killian, are you able to come in just to say a few words on policy? Yeah, um, sorry. Yes, I mean, on, in terms of, 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 of policy, uh, we had a session earlier on on um, on diaspora philanthropy, and I think there's a there's a crossover here on engagement. And I think you know from the IOM perspective, uh, there's two fundamental principles here. Um, the first being that the ownership for policy for diaspora engagement policy for diaspora investment um, needs to come high up high up within within government. I think we we've seen that. Um, with Jamaica's example today, uh, and and then secondly, and then also the example from Jamaica is is that uh, it needs to be coordinated across government. Okay, so 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 the person might sit in a foreign affairs ministry, or whatever, but it, it, you need a whole of government approach to diaspora. To, so you end up you know mainstreaming diaspora engagement policy across all policy, as it were. So there's a, there's a diaspora or migrant take on 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 all aspects. Of policy, or as much as possible, um, and we heard from from Harriet and the Kenyan uh, example that you know trying to get that into national development policies is, is crucial. So, so they're the kind of two overriding principles of from a policy level, um, high level ownership, and then coordination across government, a whole of government approach to this. Excellent. Over. Thank you. Thank you for that. I'd now like to move us on to the second question, which is. What can the future agenda document recommend in terms of programs for diaspora engagement to diaspora economic capital? So what kind of programs do we think could be useful to introduce? I, I've got a little bit of a, a question for the group as well on that subject. So if, if I was to go and meet a wealthy Scot in America, and I was to explain to him what I was doing and how he could contribute and help, he would not recognize himself as being part of something called a diaspora. He may recognize himself as being a Scot or having families with connections with Scotland, but the word diaspora doesn't seem to quite resonate. And I'm wondering if, um, if the word is correct and do we need a program to try to educate the world as to what this word means? And do we all have the same definition of diaspora? For example, in my world, you can be part of the Scottish diaspora, even if you've got no family links, no educational links, and really you've never visited Scotland. But in my diaspora, if you have a passion for the concept of Scotland, then you can become part of our diaspora. So um, I think that's, an, that's my idea about from a programme perspective. What, what do you think, for what programmes do you think we should be introducing and defining to go into the future agenda document or suggesting? Yes, Lincoln. 
Thank you, Russell. I couldn't agree with you more in terms of the definitions. Um, in terms of Jamaica, we talk about the big D and the small D, the big D being diaspora and the small D being community. And that's the challenge we have when we are on the front lines at our overseas missions. And it's a bit of a dance that you have to do in courting. So when you mentioned the high net worth individuals, we treat them in terms of uh, a separate entity in itself. You have to have targeted programs. I wanted to elaborate a little bit on the economic diplomacy program that Minister Campbell mentioned. There's a subset, an initiative called the Honorary Investment Advisor Initiative, where we utilize uh, diasporans, for instance, to for business leads and investment based on their skill sets, based on their connections. And we have at least two of our diasporans in that program, one in Japan and one here in Toronto, Canada. And for the one in Canada, I can indicate that within a year so far, he has been able to generate three business leads in construction and manufacturing to the tune of four million US dollars. So that's an example of how you can utilize your high net worth individuals. So a program targeted specifically for high net worth individuals should be considered in the as a programmatic um, contribution to the, the, the document. An excellent example, and I have to tell you, Lincoln, you're speaking to my heart. That that's that's my world that you have described. So what we so I, I almost feel a bit like a, um, a, a, a an actor in this particular session because, of course, Scotland is not a country. We are a nation within the United Kingdom. So because of that, we have a different way to actually communicate with our diaspora, people who recognise themselves as Scottish. And the approach we took was to appoint ambassadors. So today we have 30, 38 city ambassadors around the world, and they engage with the high net individuals in their cities who are Scottish to explain the programmes we are running, the projects, and how they can contribute and take part. But thank you for that. Now, I think, so. oh yeah, Uran, please come in. Thanks, Russell. Uh, I just have a comment. Uh, you just said that like your diaspora is multinational. Unfortunately, the Kyrgyz diaspora uh, is ethnical. Uh -huh. It is ethnical. And uh, uh, I would say Kyrgyz diaspora is really young. Like Kyrgyzstan, Kyrgyz Republic, we got our independence uh, with the collapse of Soviet Union, so it's been only 30 years. And uh, we are just start learning how to become a real diaspora. Like, uh, let's say 15, 10 years ago, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a diaspora. It was a public association of uh, Kyrgyz abroad. But for the past 10, 15 years, what we have noticed that they try to become a real diaspora. They learn. So when we talk about the programming and the program, I would say uh, capacity building programs for young diasporas and networking with the uh, old diasporas with, with I don't know, uh, we have the diasporas in Europe, in Western Europe. We have diasporas in Africa and the US, for example. And uh, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to connect the young diasporas with the all the one with experienced one, with a strong one, with rich diasporas, and uh, capacity building, education, and networking. I mean, when we talk about the programming, yes. And of course, of course, these young diasporas, they, sh they must, they should become a multinational because uh, Kyrgyzstan is, uh, we have more than 90 nationalities in our small, beautiful country. Uh -huh. Believe me, we're more than six million like Kyrgyz. It's uh, six million and something, but more than 90 nationalities. So uh, young diasporas, they shouldn't be uh, ethnical. They must be multinational. I mean, we need to globalize, just in short. <laughs> Thanks. Wonderful. What a great insight. Thank you for that, Uran. And now if I could move to Sarvar. Yes, hello all, thank you for having me. 
Um, I represent the government of Armenia. I work at the diaspora office in Armenia. We have several programs that we've tried to come up with to re- increase engagement with the diaspora. One of them is um, the youth ambassadors. So we invite them to Armenia. We we tell them about our story. And then when they go back home, they have one year that they, they have to be involved and engage with uh, with the country. So, and kind of create a bridge between their country of residence and the homeland. Uh, we also have another program it's called Igorts that I'm part of, I'm a fellow, um, that attracts uh, diaspora Armenians, professionals, uh, who have to have a bachelor's degree or a master's with work experience. And the goal of this program is for to attract talent from abroad, from the diaspora, to work in public institutions in Armenia. So um, I think that would be some of the ways in which we would we create engagement with the diaspora. But we're also coming up with an initiative. We actually made a survey that we sent out to our network in the diaspora, which is related to diaspora bonds. Why? Because there are four ways of economic engagement uh, from the diaspora to Armenia. One of them is remittances. The other one is charity. The other one is um, opening up a business or real estate. So this would be a way for them to invest and get some profit and then also be more involved in the policies that the government is taking in Armenia. And also that will strengthen the ties between the diaspora and the country. So um, let's hope the government, we just uh, submitted the report last night. So let's hope that the government gives us a green light and we can go ahead with us with that. But that that is what we're doing right here. What an excellent insight from Armenia. That that is just you're absolutely spot on with those examples of projects. May, may I ask the group on this subject? Do we believe that government plays a critical part in this area of diaspora, or is it possible to run a diaspora without government involvement? Because if we're talking about policies and projects, we're all talking about involving government. Russell, if I'll just step in with an observation from this morning's yeah. session of philanthropy. Similar question was asked, but the takeaway there was that the the gov- governments play a facilitating role in in, in much of the engagement. Um, that they aren't necessarily solely the executioners. That you know, it's it's about partnerships, about stakeholders, and. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that if someone else wants to come uh-huh. in. But that was just a takeaway from this morning's session that I think is relevant to the question you've asked. That's excellent. Thank you. There are some hands up. I'm not sure. Kingsley, Servart, Nadami, have you just not taken your hands down or do you want to come in? Actually, I took it down and put it up. Is that is that allowed? Oh, sorry, I missed that, Kingsley. <laughs> no, no. So just pick it up on a few of your points because I, I actually, sorry. Okay. I know you uh, you talked about the Scottish uh, ambassadors, which is fantastic. Copenhagen as a city have global ambassadors around the world. So I think that's a really good model. And I think lots of us would like to learn more about how that operates and how effective it is and how do you do it. I love the fact you mentioned you, through LinkedIn, it costs you zero because I find in diaspora engagement, uh, zero is a very compelling price point when you're trying to do something. So that's great. Um, but I would ask the question, for example, with you, Russell, Who knows all the Scottish dentists in the world? Or who knows all the Scottish vets in the world? And generally, when you ask that question of a country, the answer is actually nobody. And sometimes the professional organizations do. Because the reason is, you get Scottish dentists together from all around the world, they come together, they've got a lot in common. It's in their self-interest to engage with these fellow dentists around the world. So I think that that's that's a a thing that's yet to really happen because we don't have the data and we haven't been able to put that stuff together. But I think there's real potential there. I mean, and I mentioned that word self-interest because that's something that drives a lot of diaspora engagement. I mean, Bill Gates famously said the two great drivers of mankind is self-interest and helping others, which is a lovely kind of uh, sort of of contradiction. Um, So um, I was just going to say... uh, these are being things have been made possible by big data, which we're in this world of big data, where you can really drill into 
hundreds of millions of pieces of data. There's a company in Paris called Onomastics, um, a guy called um, Elian Karsena of Namsor. And particularly for countries like Lithuania, or Armenia, or even Scotland and Ireland, there are very distinctive surnames. So you can start mapping. So when they did a project where they found Lithuanians working in the bioscience industries in the United States, and they actually resulted in an inward investment from some one of these people that was identified using big data. That's a bit of a game changer. And I think that's an interesting kind of evolution and a way of using the potential out there through technology. Great examples, Kingsley. Great examples. Sorry, is someone looking to come in? Oh, yes. Yes, Lincoln. Thank you. I, I neglected to introduce myself. I'm the Consul General of Jamaica at Toronto. I wanted to respond on behalf of the team with respect to whether government should be in, involved. Uh, our experience from 2003 is that government brought together the diaspora from the UK, Canada and the USA, along with our private sector, what we call our legacy partners, three, four main uh, principles. And what we did subsequent to that early consult consultation was to have a conference, which started in 2004. So we have these biennial conference inclusive of one to be held in June of this year. In the interregnum, what we did was to engage international development partners, the IOM, uh, among others. And at every level, our missions overseas are at the forefront of this engagement. So, for instance, myself here in Toronto, it is we have a, a huge diaspora, well over 250,000 and over 300,000 in Canada as a whole, over 1.7 million in the US and 800,000 in the United Kingdom. This for us is, is central to the work that we do. Representation is, is strong for us. We engage our, our private sector partners on a daily, weekly, monthly basis in terms of literacy programs, in terms of events. Um, also, we spearhead as a government uh, program where we honor our diasporans through the Governor General's Achievement Awards. And so for us in, in Jamaica and colleagues in the Caribbean, governments are at the center because we are the ones, especially our missions overseas, are the ones that the community respects and regards to pull the communities together, which is why I was speaking earlier of the Mover and Shaker initiative through the Honor Investment Advisor Program. And we do the same with academia. Recently here in Toronto, we collaborated with our Jamaica Tourist Board the Ministry of Tourism and the Global Tourism Resilience and Crisis Management Center to establish a satellite office at George Brown College, which will focus on research and entrepreneurship. So that's another example. Um, I, I noted Killian had in his paper, Economic Diplomacy, but also uh, as it relates to how you engage academia, that's relevant for the country of residence as it is for countries of origin. So we have to look at how we can scope some of these projects um, and they're not um, exclusive to countries of origin or country of residence, but it takes uh, consultation. And that's the point I want to leave us with, that governments really bring the stakeholders together. That is the key. And in mainstreaming it across uh, all governments, uh, private sector and civil society, it's the government, depending on your government, of course, but that is our experience. What an excellent point to have made there, Lincoln. Thank you so much for coming in. Yes, Ulan. Uh, may I just add something? I represent Council for Migration under the Speaker of the Kyrgyz Republic Parliament. So uh, one year and four months ago, we didn't have this council. When the Speaker of the Parliament visited Moscow, he met Moscow diaspora in Russia, and they asked to establish Council for Migration under the speaker. Let me tell you why. Because they need the help uh, of the decision makers at the top level, the high level. Unfortunately, young diasporas like Kyrgyz one, they do not have uh, enough 
uh, let's say, capacity. They do not have enough experience. It, they, they cannot uh, like directly, directly talk to Russian decision makers. So what they do, they just address to the Council for Migration with their problems and ask the Speaker of the Parliament to solve it with his colleague in Moscow. And believe me, this is how it works today. I mean, it works, it worked out. And the young diasporas, of course, we have like uh, different diasporas, different types of diasporas, but young diasporas like Kyrgyz one, they need the help. They need the help of the government. They need the help of top level decision makers. So I truly believe, yes. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much for that. And if, if you don't mind, I'm going to move on to the third question now. So, can, so I, the can I make a contribution? Yes, sure. my hand is up. yes please. Yeah, so thank you very much. Just a quick one. For us, yes, uh, just like my previous speakers, the issue of government being at the center of uh, diaspora diplomacy is very important because the government plays a key role in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in Kenya. In fact, diaspora pillar is one of our five uh, uh, interlinked pillars of our foreign policy. And therefore, for us to be able to harness any diverse uh, knowledge, skills, and expertise from the Kenyans, the facilitative role, and I just want to underpin, you know, to reiterate, the facilitating role of the government in that, uh, in, uh, in advancing the diplomacy uh, the diaspora diplomacy is very, very important. And in fact, the implementation of the, of the policies or whether it is development of uh, institutional frameworks as well as legal that looks at the matters diaspora, the government plays a key role. Thank you very much. Thank you now. I'm now going to move on to that third question, which and di di diaspora diplomacy will come into this. And the third question is about partnerships. What should our advice be for the future agenda document when we talk about partnership? Who should these partners be? How should we engage with them? And, and I have to tell you, this is my specialist subject. So um, what we've discovered is finding organizations who wanted to partner and then working out a common goal whereby our own self-interest could be still be met by achieving the common goal that we and the partner would aim to achieve has been a game changer. And what we also discovered is partnerships can be quite a strange thing. They require a lot of work, but you may end up engaging and partnering with organizations which you didn't even identify as a potential partner at the start. So we've seen that partnership with celebrity, for example, can have a huge game changer for us, where we now live in a world of influencers. And to partner with an influencer whereby we can bring out their engagement with Scotland and their relationship there, and they can then tell their followers, really broadcast our message better than any marketing campaign we could have done. So I'd like to bring in Servart now to talk about the subject of partnerships. Well, yes, as I'm sure you all know, Kim Kardashian is of Armenian descent. She's one of the most, uh, the one that has one of the most um, in numbers in on Instagram, I don't know. She's one of the most followed people on earth. Yeah, so yeah. she she has been uh, amazing in that respect. Uh, into regarding uh, creating awareness regarding the Armenian genocide or the war uh, that uh, when we were attacked by Azerbaijan in the war of 2020. Um, so I think they do have a key role, and they they help to raise awareness in what's going on in the country, especially in diaspora and also people who are not or who do not where Armenia is located, for instance. And they do their research. If Kim Kardashian is talking about this, they go on Google and they do the research about what's going on in Armenia. So I think uh, they play a key role in, in engaging not, not only diasporans, but also uh, people who are not of Armenian descent. That is such an excellent point. You know, so there are people in our diaspora who don't know they're in our diaspora, but when they find out, they love it. Um, Mutond or Muten Rogers, would you like to come in? 
Uh, thank you, Russell. Uh, let me make my comments on uh, partnerships. Uh, we all understand that the current world uh, depends so much on partnerships. Uh, you can't wish it away. But uh, uh, in the case of Kenya, I see a lot of partnership uh, between the government and the diaspora. Uh, the people themselves form uh, part and parcel of this uh, uh, partnership fabric. But apart from that, uh, we appreciate the role of corporate entities in uh, shaping uh, government and uh, lobby government to come up with strategies that facilitate uh, the movement of uh, diaspora economic capital. Uh, you are talking of uh, uh, companies, you're talking of large multinationals and uh, banking sector and uh, their interest in uh, receiving, their interest in transferring and their interest in providing platforms to save uh, and to invest diaspora capital back in the country. But on the other side, uh, you know, I'm looking at the diaspora as people who still have social and cultural attachment to their home country and their communities. Therefore, knowing uh, in a well-organized uh, government diaspora in a destination country, we are able to know uh, the origin of this diaspora and therefore it will be important and uh, possible to engage the community that remained behind in order to make sure that the diaspora economic capital is well taken care of. In Kenya, we have had complaints of uh, diaspora remitting or investing back home, but when they come back physically, you don't find what you are sending. You don't find anything. Maybe you invested in real estate, you invested maybe in uh, stocks and that. You find the information you are given maybe by your relatives back in the country was wrong and you come, you have to go back to the government and ask the government to play the role of a number, to play the role of an adjudicator. That's why a partnership should have the three pillars, the government, the diaspora, the corporate, and that is four pillars and the community where the diaspora originates from. And originate from, I mean, in the country of origin. Thank you. Thank you. That was very useful. Who would like to come in next to discuss the subject of partnerships? Nordia. Hi, everyone. <laughs> I'm Nordia, and I'm from Jamaica, and I'm honored to be here. And as I heard of partnerships, um, it, it speaks volumes to what is needed in diaspora. It's one thing to bring visibility. But there are lots of persons within the different diasporas who want to invest in their country but just don't know how. Yeah. Simply documentation, they may have difficulties accessing, understanding, because they may have left their country for years or they may be first generations who have no idea of what to do. So my, my recommendation is that you have strategic partners who work along either with the government or the existing diaspora or organization in these various countries to educate the diaspora about what to do how to do it, when to do it, when is the right time to buy a property, where to buy a property, for example. What do I, what do I need to know? What um, um, I, tax ID, what, what other documentations I need to, how about my birth certificate? You know, all those things. So my company, which is Integrated Diaspora Services, for example, um, based in Jamaica to serve the diaspora, I'm actually in the US now because we're doing pop-up shops across different spaces to educate the diaspora, how do I do it? And hold the hand and show them how, get back to the Jamaica and ensure it is executed. Because we believe every person in Jamaica is connected to Jamaica. You need to know how to do what to do in your country, you know? And that is how they can effectively contribute the economic growth and development of their country when they know how to, and they, they have the hand holding in executing the same. What a wonderful point to raise. And, and you also remind me of the, the similarity of the world we're all in, but we're not competing. So on Thursday and Friday next week, I will be in Manhattan at a pop-up Scottish shop. 
whereby we are we are we are sharing some um, products yes. and services from Scotland. So it's it's the same across the world. We're all taking these same actions. And, right. and do you believe with me, Nordia, that I think diaspora is still at a very early stage, and that over the next ten years, this is going to become a a major economic driver for countries. It is a major economic drive for countries. And all we have to do really is put all those collaborative energies and synergies and expertise together to empower our people, bring it all together, inform, empower, and build our in different countries. Wonderful. Thank you, Nordia. I think we'll You're all welcome. have to go to Jamaica to learn more about the, the, the secrets that you have. <laughs> and, and could I turn to Kingsley? Yeah, listen, I think that was a fantastic contribution. And I mean, they've all been really fascinating contributions. I just backpedal a little bit back to the government debate, because I think the real partners very often are government, because governments have things that the rest of us don't have. They've got kind of clout. They've got resources. They've got smart, well, um, well-educated people running their their operations. They've got money. You know, they've got a status. People will go to events in an embassy. I think I'm going to an event in the British Embassy in Dublin for the Scottish Accountancy in the next week or two. I see, see that on my agenda. I think that that's oh, great. I <laughs> totally told you. Um, I think also, um, you know, the second thing was just about celebrity. I think that's that's really interesting. I mean, last week, Glasgow Celtic had an event in New York City and the Rod Stewart was the key, you know, got up and sang a few songs and kicked a few balls into the audience. But I mean, that was a use of celebrity. It attracted, it raised a lot of money and attracted a terrific array of people from, uh, from that area. But I think the piece that hasn't really quite happened yet, and I think that will fuel your thought of 10 years from now, we'll be in a, a totally different place. I think that's the, that's the engagement of corporates of great corporates who will begin increasingly, and we need to really convince them of this, begin to realize that this is a market opportunity, that there's commercial realities in this. Now, the airlines are getting it now, the tourism people get it, but I don't think quite yet the technology companies get it. And I think that that's going to be really fascinating. And as you know, uh, we now live in a world where it's more important what you do than where you are. You know, the old days, geography dictated your identity, but now because of technology, you can be you can be anywhere and do this job. I mean, you, nobody knows where I am today or where you are today, and yet we're carrying on a bit of business together. So I think that they're the sorts of dynamics out there which are augur very well for this sector for the next decade. Thank you, Kingsley. That's excellent. Um, anyone else wanting to come in? Sir Vart, are you wanting to come in? Yes, um, yes. I think Kingsley said uh, something that is very valid. Um, us, our experience with the diaspora is that they do want to, they want to do something, but they don't know how. So I feel like I, I believe that the government should be the point person in that sense. Uh, I also believe that celebrities and influencers have these reach that we that the government can't our social media is not as engaging as kim kardashian or uh dan bilzerian or other Ar uh, um, armenians or or of ethnic uh ethnic armenians who live abroad i think um that's uh especially serge tankian who is the singer of uh, system of a down he has a lot of followers and he keeps posting things that are happening in armenia or he he posts the programs that the government is running for, for instance, Igor's the one, if it weren't for Igor's, I'm from Argentina. If it weren't for Igor's, I wouldn't be living in Armenia. So um, I think that's, um, that these influencers and celebrities are key and they have this outreach that even the government cannot, even with money or with uh, other resources, we can't reach. So um, I think uh, it should be a, it's a key facilitator in, in engaging the diaspora. Yeah. I, I, I think that that term of you, everyone on this call is a, is a key facilitator as well, because you all have a passion for your particular nation, your particular diaspora that you're supporting. And, and just to follow on of what Sir Vartan Kingsley said there, the single most common question I get asked by individuals around the world when uh, we discuss the diaspora, the single most common question question they ask me is, Russell, how can we help? 
Mm-hmm. And it's it, it's interesting that actually perhaps what we need is a library of projects which these individuals can then engage with. It may be an investment project or a philanthropic project. And I sometimes feel, rather than making them up on the spot, um, I should actually have a, a library of these projects. And the, the other thing about this area of partnerships, I think it's about broadcasting the fact you have the partnership as well. Because we have a partnership with the Scottish government, that doesn't mean so much in some countries. In other countries, it's very important because it means we've got a level of endorsement. The partnership that we have with a number of the the technology groups within Scotland is important as we reach out and we can build from their brand. So I I think partnerships is critical to all this. Um, Would anyone else like to come in to discuss this point or or really to make any final comments? Because we've only got 15 minutes left. Um, and I'd like to um, to make sure we finish on time. So any other comments, please come in and, and share your thoughts on what you've heard today. If you Kingsley, could make just a small contribution. Yes, please, on you go. Uh, yes, I'd like to... Just say that, uh, yes, uh, the partnerships with the diaspora is very important if we want to make them become the main drivers in the implementation of some of our national development programs. So partnering with the diaspora and and other stakeholders is very key. In Kenya, I think what we've seen again with the diaspora, and that's why partnerships are important, is the issue of trust. So we really have to build trust and confidence then we have to have effective engagement uh, through partnerships. Thank you. Thank you, Dave, for that. Trust, absolutely essential. I, I've got one idea about partnerships, which we don't really talk about, which is partnerships between diaspora organisations. So, for example, if, if my organisation, Scotland, partnered with the, um, the, 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 the diaspora of Turkey, what we could perhaps deliver together, could we be identifying people of um, members of the Turkish diaspora in Scotland and they could identify people of the Scottish diaspora in Turkey? Are these other partnerships that we can explore? But I think Kingsley hit the key, which is at some point over the next five to 10 years, big business is going to realize they need to be involved in this space and we must be ready on how what terms we're going to partner with them to make sure that um, we're not doing all the hard work at the moment and then the big businesses come in and um, perhaps make the profit out of it all. We want to make sure that we are um, attracting this investment to do the right things within our countries. I also think, uh, just to pick up on that, Russell, I I think you touch on a really interesting point. We all think of diaspora, we're chased the Scottish diaspora, the Irish diaspora, the New Zealand diaspora, in our own countries there are really interesting groups of diasporas. So I've been training the Lithuanians in Dublin. Now, I think it's in Ireland's interest. Like 25% of the working population of Dublin were not born in Ireland. So Google of 10,000 people in Dublin, 8,500 of them are are not Irish. So we've attracted in all these terrific individuals, uh, fabulously smart and well-educated, and they're a great resource for Ireland. I'm trying to convince the government here that we should be working and helping and helping those organizations capacity build and grow and they can raise money and all that kind of stuff. We shouldn't be purely going down the route of just purely Irish. I think we should do this as part and parcel of, uh, of, of, of servicing these people and making them feel welcome. But also there's an economic benefit in that because it will result in, in increasing connections and relations back to their home countries, which is going to be good for everybody. Absolutely. Great point, Kingsley. And again, I go back to Nudama's point about trust. So trust is at the centre of all of it. Um, We're just coming to the end, and I'm I'm not quite sure from the agenda, but I wondered if the Honourable Leslie Campbell wanted to come in to say a few words. Thank you, um, Mr. Daglish. Um, <laughs> not, not the Kenny. Um, um, I, we know it's, it's, it's the first. Um, you know, you really had me on that one. But um, it's, it's, <laughs> um, it's, it's been a really interesting um, discussion taking place. And um, 
particularly as it, as it relates to, to partnerships. Um, for our own part, um, we realize that um, we have the United Nations development goals to be met. And what we have been doing um, in recent times is to engage those groups with the te technical competence and know-how how to do the things which would help us uh, to meet those developmental goals. Um, for, for instance, we, let's say in, in, in the energy sector, we have our diasporans who have the, um, the know-how and technical competence and who are perhaps in Namibia or residing someplace else. And we have been engaging uh, with, 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 with such and trying to establish partnerships with such individuals to bring that uh, technical know-how so that um, to achieve or I think our target is to achieve 50% of renewables by 2030. So um, those are the areas that, that, that we tend to. And another area um, in relation to food security, um, trying to engage our diasporans who have the, the, the know-how. Um, we, we have some people in, in, in the UK who have, have done uh, great things and we're trying to pull those together. But generally, um, I think it, it, it is a most rewarding area um, for, for, instead of a man being awarded, say, with one of the national honor of uh, the Order of Jamaica or whatever it is, if he's part of uh, that body of work and which really drives Jamaica forward and, and, and to take people out of poverty, that, that I think is much more rewarding than. Um, another area, uh, we, we've found that in the broader technology area, um, and particularly it's, it's, it's been highlighted because of uh, COVID-19, our education sector has really been battered. Um, our children, um, you know, uh, lost two years or three years, for that matter, um, of engagement. Uh, and, and so that we have that deficit and we have to find partnerships with uh, or to establish partnerships with people who can develop content and all of that um, so that in the um, we won't suffer too badly. Because when those people who were, we expect to be in the working world in the next, next five years uh, suffer this, we certainly won't be able to compete. And, 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 and so it, it is important that as we move along the trajectory, that we continue to engage and, 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 and uh, you know, um, to benefit from. And at the same time, the persons who are engaging with us would benefit from providing the technologies and the know-how and, and all of that. So may I just encourage all of, all of us who, because I believe we'd, we've suffered in different ways. Um, and, 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 and I think that is an area that we, um, we, we, we ought to focus on. But generally, I think um, the, the partnership, um, you know, is, is really the way to go. Um, it, it is uh, generally um, we, we have little sayings, you know. If 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 you if you really want to uh, to go far, um, you should um, just walk together. Uh, and 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 I and I think it's 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 it, that sums up for us where we our approach to partnership. Thank you. And I thank you for those incredibly powerful words. That's I think raised the discussion up to the. You know, the, the the magnitude of what we can achieve, and I, I, I just in this this act of partnership, I'll share my LinkedIn details in the chat if anyone wants to connect or follow up with anything, and I'll attempt to help you any way I can. This has been an incredibly useful way to spend two hours for me. I, I'm new to all this. I'm only five years in. It's four years since I first heard the word diaspora. I wasn't aware of the word. Next week, I'll be in Manhattan in New York with an enormous Scottish flag taking, a, taking part in a celebration of Scottish connections with America. This was something, an event, Tartan Day, that I was unaware of four years ago. 
And I would urge everyone to run projects within your country to identify these diaspora assets we have around the world, because there's such a way to bond together our community. So the, the, the findings from this particular session will now be analysed and will go forth into the report. And uh, I'd like to just thank everyone. It's been an absolute pleasure to spend time with you today. Any final words, Kingsley? You still got your hand up? My final word is a great job, Russell. I thought you did a super job. And uh, hats off to you and, to, uh, and the Scottish Business Network and all who sail, sail in it. Good luck. Thank you, everyone. It's been a privilege to meet you all. Thank you. Russell, thanks, everybody. Thank Just you, Dave. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.